Okay, hey everyone, hope you enjoyed uh, the talk. I thought it was uh, really, really cool. I couldn't follow chat too much, but it looked like people were finding it interesting. And uh, yeah, guys, so we're gonna be doing uh, three plus two arena uh, just for fun. If you guys wanna play, get some uh, games in. Uh, let me actually get the uh, standings here. If you guys can see. Um, it's gonna be starting in just under four minutes. You can get the link via exclam play in the chat uh, if you want to uh, join the event. You do have to be a member of our club on chess.com, so just keep that in mind. You got to join the club first, and then the uh, arena is open to everyone. And uh, yeah, you can join anytime, leave anytime. You can play as many or as few games as you want. Uh, I'll be streaming some of the action here. And yeah, should be uh, should be good training. Um, we've got another sub battle coming up tomorrow against uh, Samai Raina, who's um, you guys don't know him. He's actually like the top Indian streamer slash stand up comic <laughs> slash chess player. Actually, really funny guy. I enjoy his streams with Chess Base India when I have a chance to uh, to watch them. But um, sub battle is going to be taking place tomorrow, twelve thirty p.m. If you haven't signed up for that yet, we do need a player for different ranges. Uh, I post it in the uh, in the Discord, in the announcement section, uh, if you want to sign up for that. We need a couple players, like 15, 1600, 16 to 1700. Uh, if you want to play the sub battle, make sure to join our roster on arena.gl. There's the link in the chat, arena.gl slash chess dojo. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, really important to uh, sign up for that ahead of time as it takes some time to, uh, let's say, verify your account. Is there a minimum number of games um, to play the sub battle? Yeah, you do need 50 Blitz games played on your chess.com account. So, uh, yeah, make sure that you have 50 games played. If not, then... Um, yeah, unfortunately, they, they won't let you in. They're kind of strict on that to prevent people, you know, sandbagging and, and this kind of thing. Uh, and I think they take your rating that you sign up for um, at, at the start. So if you signed up and your rating is like 1,400, you drop down. I, I think they, they it doesn't adjust based on you bouncing up or, or down as far as I know. Hey, thanks, Nose Nose All. Much appreciated. Uh, I assume you mean the, the Vegas tournament, right? National Open? Yeah, I mean, uh, I do try to calculate. <laughs> Indeed. Um, here's a link for uh, everyone. If you haven't joined the tournament yet, you should be able uh, to join there. And uh, yeah, the arena is going to be starting in just under a minute. Good luck to all players. Daster, I think I missed your joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the talk was, was so interesting. I mean, it was, honestly, the chat can be pretty distracting. So I try not to, um, I keep an eye on it, like in case like the volume blows out or something and, and people are, <laughs> people let us know, but otherwise I just <laughs> try to focus on the conversation. Um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be starting uh, here in just a sec. Nice, uh, Mimelangelo. Very cool. Yeah, OTB tournaments are hard. My number one advice, if you're if you've never played an OTB tournament, uh, is to practice OTB beforehand. I think that's practice playing with a clock, writing notation. I think that's critical. Uh, okay, guys, here we go. Looks like we have some games underway. We have a Aaron against uh, Partbreaker. And all right, knows knows all. Now, if you're playing the arena right now, please, please, please do mute the stream or just close out of it. Uh, I don't want to comment on your games and, and give either you or your opponent some tips. Uh, I also think it's just distracting, so we should be focusing on the games and learning to, uh, to stay focused on one thing without listening to the stream. So yeah, make sure to have it muted. Um, this uh, arena is open to everyone as long as you're a member of our chess.com club. So make sure to join the chess.com club. And then once you've joined, 
uh, it should show up in uh, live chess. I think for the arena, I set a minimum number of games around 20. So if you don't have like any Blitz games on your account, you might not be able to uh, to play. Uh, though I'm not sure actually if I actually set a minimum on that. I don't I don't remember. Usually I set a minimum, but I don't know if I actually did for uh, for this one. Oh, the Mubot link isn't working. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Let me uh, let me fix it. My bad, guys. My bad. Okay, that should be that should be better. Hopefully, the new link uh, works fine. Yeah, I thought the link was uh, looking okay, but I guess not. Hey, door with the 17 months. Nice. Thanks for the sub. Dor, we gotta get um we gotta get your lesson. <laughs> I've been meaning to do it for like a while now. Uh I'm gonna message you right now. <laughs> uh because I'm gonna have some time this week to get back to the uh the one on one lessons. Oh, Seth. Yeah, I saw your game one uh, finished quickly. Let's see what happened here. Oh, nice early queen b3. Yeah, this, um, when we develop the bishop enough on f5 here in the slob, we have to be careful about developing it, developing it too early, exactly for this reason, because white's queen comes out and um, it's hard for black to defend b7. So e4 here, actually very good move, Seth, just opening up the bishop. And uh, yeah, this is already very, very tough for black. So nice, um, nice display of opening knowledge here. Good tactics. Yeah, well played. Beautiful. Um, okay, let's see. We also have uh, Aaron playing white here. Um, yeah, chess numbers. I think uh, I will try to open it up soon. Basically, we just fell behind like last couple weeks. And so there's a number of lessons I want to get through first, but I think I will I'll open it back up soon. I'm worried once I open it up, it's going to be like a flood <laughs> of requests. But the plan is to open it up again. So it's not not going to be gone forever. Yeah, 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 all good. All right, what's happening here? Looking um, kind of comfortable for black, actually, with the two bishops, dark squared bishop, very nice piece. Uh, I'm a fan of this one, kind of blockading white's pawn. Still solid for white, but I, I think I would choose black if I uh, if I had to take a side. Um, yeah, you guys are still welcome to join the arena. It'll be open the whole 54 minutes. 
and I'll try to follow as many games as I can. Uh, did you guys enjoy the talk? For those of you that were here for Dojo Talks, uh, I mean, I saw I saw some good good feedback, but it would be nice to uh, to hear some more. Would you guys want us to get uh, Benji back for like uh, a part two? I feel like there's yeah so much more we could we could talk about. Hey, gratify with the sub. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Kappa. Uh, apparently, um, they they often stream late at night. Yeah, Benji was great. <laughs> okay. Oh, White's in time trouble here, but he's uh, he's playing on. Bishop takes G two. Okay, we're getting some trades. Um, hmm. Interesting question from Flying Horse Cow. So playing with the Hustler in the park earlier, and he pulled a double illegal move trick and claimed it's legal in the rules. Is that true? So you're you're talking, you're saying like that famous case with Magnus and Anarchia, right? Where like if you make an illegal move, that's losing. But then if the opponent responds and their move is also illegal, then like they lose. I don't know. I think it depends on. Um, I think they actually changed that rule as far as FIDE is concerned because that's like it seems so silly like the opponent makes an illegal move then you make an illegal move and then they can like call you and like forfeit you um I don't know I I think it really uh because you didn't take his king he wins yeah I mean like number one if you're playing in a park that's not like a FIDE sanctioned game right so you can't it's not really fair to say like oh we're following like you know FIDE rules usually it's kind of um a oh, well played here by black f5 very nice move i think this is yeah lost for white so good good play in the uh king and pawn end game there um i uh, yeah i think it, you have to kind of agree with the player that you're playing with because a lot of times when you're playing casually it's not even touch move like you can play clock move for example which means your move is done when you hit the clock and not when you let go of a piece, right? But in USCF and FIDE rules, like they usually use touch move. So it sounds like the hustler was trying to hustle you. That's what it sounds like, you know? <laughs> and I think it's just something you have to kind of agree with um, with the, the guy you're actually playing. Because um, it's, I mean, you know, people play by different rules. Like a lot of times when you're playing casually, there, there is no touch move. They often use uh, clock move, um, which I think is actually a cleaner rule, because then it's like, okay, your move is done when you hit the clock. That's like very simple. Versus like, okay, you touch a piece. Did you let go of it? Did you not let go of it? Right? Like it's you know can get uh, can get confusing. But there's no there's no ambiguousness whether you hit the clock or not. That's something that should be very clear. Oh, wow, Rick takes B two. Interesting sacrifice, but I, I don't think this one, uh, okay, it, it, it shouldn't have worked. Uh, now it's going to work. Uh, wow, uh, these guys are playing very, very quickly. No good, no good. So rook takes b2, very quick sack, and then queen b4 check. Dritman played king c1 immediately and should have gone and checkmated after queen a3 check, followed by rook b8, where, okay, you can play knight b5, but then this one is, is going to be hanging. Um, instead, king a1. And I think white is doing very good. Just rook b1 next. So king c1 played way too fast there. We need to calculate and look at these concrete lines. And now black plays rook b8, which maybe is a good move. I'm not sure. Okay, we resigned here. Uh, I feel like that was premature, right? You can still go rook e1, and you're not getting mated. Um, so I don't really don't understand this one. <laughs> these guys playing way too fast. You go rookie one, there's no mate. <laughs> Why are we resigning with two minutes on the clock? You gotta think a little bit and and figure it out. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Uh, hopefully a useful lesson for everyone there. Try not to get too nervous and try to, you know, remain objective if you can. 
All right, we have Hughes against Nose Nose All. Rook endgame. Looks nice for white. This rook on the seventh rank is pretty uh, pretty strong. But let's see if Hughes can convert it. These guys also playing so fast. Two, two, two minutes, 55 seconds on the clock. <laughs> Insane. So, yeah, that Inarchy of Carlson thing, I mean, that was kind of ridiculous, right? And I don't think Inarchy of was... Um, necessarily trying to, to pull a fast one. I, I really don't know, right? Can't speak to his intentions. But um, yeah, the idea that like a double legal move results in a loss for the second player, it just, it does kind of open it up with, uh, open it up to all kinds of kind of like bad faith uh, tricks, right? So I think, um, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of BS, especially if you're playing casually, like, yeah, you kind of have to, uh, I don't know, for the longest time, the rule was, like, first illegal move loses, but uh, if you don't call someone's illegal move, that doesn't mean that you lose, I think that's, yeah, kind of a ridiculous rule. Uh, what's fair is, like, yeah, like, you just resume from the last legal position, right, I think that, that just seems like a very fair, right, like, you had a position, someone made an illegal move, okay, you go back and play from there, right? Like, I think that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, but the problem is that you're playing, you know, in the park. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> okay, four versus three. Okay, not the most interesting position. I'm going to jump to a different game, though I'm sure Hughes is going to try to uh, convert this one. Let's see, did he have any chances to... I feel like he was doing really well, but... Black played very nice move a5 here, I think, getting some counterplay. Maybe white should have played a3 to kind of prevent black from being able to break free. I'm not sure. But probably there was something he could have done here to keep better chances. All right, let's jump to Rosenberg against Cartier Tank. Looks like Rosenberg has the exchange, looking to convert. Yeah, sounds like a tough, tough experience. Um, so, guys, I'm actually, I just got a message from the the mod from Samai Raina, and there's a looks like they are gonna have to postpone. I'll make an official announcement in the Discord um, soon, but uh, yeah, gratify. I was gonna have you play for the 600 to 800 range, but it looks like they looks like sub battles not happening tomorrow unfortunately. And we're just going to have to do it another time. So, sorry about that. Uh, but I hope you get some games in anyway, more time to practice and train. Yeah, we will be doing another sub battle uh, I believe next weekend with uh, Anna Rudolph stream. So that'll be fun. But uh, yeah, it looks like it's not happening tomorrow. Sorry about that. Anyway, more time to train, more time to uh, to get good for the future battles. Okay, looks like white won this one. Let's keep it going. We got Laurent playing white against Rosenberg. Yeah, thanks for everyone who uh, followed and resubbed, by the way. I, I know I missed a few during the stream but uh, your support is super appreciated. So thanks for that. I am welcome for your existence. Funny.
Okay, so this is a kind of a Tory attack type of setup. Similar to the London, it's like very solid and it gives uh, white some very clear plans. Um, I like black setup here in that he hasn't committed to the D pawn, so he can still put this one on D6, which I imagine is where this pawn is going to kind of fight for the E5 square, not let white get this kind of nice grip on E5. letting the discord know that sub battle tomorrow is uh, looks like postponed Uh, I guess uh, something came up for, for Semi. He's a busy guy. I'm not really sure. Um, in the meantime, guys, we're going to have another set of team matches for the Dojo chapters coming up tomorrow. Um, if you haven't signed up for your team and you would like to play for Team USA, Team Canada, Team uh, Europe, Team Latin America, Team United Kingdom, uh, you can use the Google Doc. You can also request the role in the Discord. We have a new channel for roles that is um, really, really useful. You can just get your role assigned automatically and that'll allow you to um, view the uh, the proper channel down below. Um, so yeah, if you wanna play a two game rapid match every Sunday, we were just doing our first season um, these last few weeks. There's gonna be a couple matches tomorrow. Um, I think Team Canada is playing Team Europe, if I'm not mistaken, and Team UK is playing Team Latin America. Uh, visit the Roles channel in Discord and you can get your role there uh, adjusted uh, automatically. So yeah, cool, cool update. Okay, so yeah, we kind of see what I was talking about here. Black puts the pawn on D6 and that allows him to keep the D5 square for his pieces. Bishop is also opened up. This rook on a7 looks funny, but the idea is usually to play queen a8, and that can be kind of a nice uh, a nice setup. And yeah, it's tough for white to find a plan here because he doesn't have this e5 square for the knight. So yeah, interesting setup from, uh, from uh, Rosenberg. Uh, and I believe, guys, coming up later today, we're going to be doing another uh, gauntlet episode. Not at the usual time. I'm pretty sure it's going to be uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time with uh, Australian Grandmaster Anton uh, Smirnov. I think that's his name. Young kid. Very, very, um, very talented out of Australia. Let me confirm with David, but I believe that's happening at 4 p.m. Do Grandmasters get all of their theory from Chessbase? So Chessbase, we should make clear, is a program where you kind of keep notes, like you can keep databases um, or like let's say you have like a database of your games and you want to save it or you have a database of puzzles or like opening analysis so it's like very similar to Leechess studies in terms of its function um, but within chess space what people do is they have very very large databases of like millions of games so like mega database is a popular one there's also one called big database there's one called Kaisa base 
Um, so yeah, most players, they kind of follow the theory using those big databases, but the way to actually navigate them is you need some kind of program like Chessbase or like Sid versus PC, where you can actually, um, you can actually follow the, like the latest games and, and see the theory. Uh, yeah, look, I can go back a couple moves. Let's see, where did black push f5? So f5 was played here. Yeah, kind of a... Well, so here's what happened. So bishop takes h4, black took a piece, white played queen e4, threatening mate. Black played f5. And uh, here you could take on e6 and take on d5 to get back your piece, but then there's going to be some kind of discovered attack, like knight takes b4 at the end. So Laurent decides to win back his bishop kind of in a cleaner way. So that's why we didn't see white um, taking on e6. Okay, let me jump to the live game because there's a lot of stuff going on. And uh, yeah, very, very sharp end game, but these players are on seconds. I feel like black is doing well. He has this one weakness defended by the knight, though there is another weakness on b5 that he has to be careful about. And now we're gonna see possibly some trades here. Yeah, it takes on c3. And I don't know, I mean, white has a nice outside pass pawn, but at the same time, his pawns are isolated, so it's a very double-edged position still. Like, I'm not even sure who's better, because the d-pawn is weak, but the b-pawn is very, very strong. And so here we see black just playing for counterplay, doesn't even try to, uh, to win it. Yeah. Rook b2. Oh, gotta move, gotta move. Oh no. Unfortunate flag. Probably some panic, but white, I think, was still doing uh, quite well here. But, yeah, what are you gonna do? Time trouble is uh, is unfortunate. Okay, we have Aaron playing against Rosenberg. Let's jump to another game. Here we have Hughes against uh, Max Malinek. Two long time subs. Looks like extra pawn for Hughes. And he is looking to convert. Ooh, f4, 93. Creates a square for the king. King g2. And yeah, black needs to find some compensation for, uh, for the pawn. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, when you, even on two second increment, you still have to play very fast. You know, the two seconds goes by so quickly. So really not easy to, uh, especially I, I often say, you know, the burden of a good position is a tough thing in blitz. Cause when you have a bad position, okay, you just move pieces back and forth. Uh oh, looks like we blundered mates. Oops. Um, but, uh, when you have a good position, it's like you want to find good moves. And so that ends up spending, uh, costing you some extra time. All right, let's see some other players here. Well, a lot of mismatches. Okay, we have Laurent against Cartier Tank. Looks like we got B3, B3 club. Chess Twitter is all about the B3 nowadays. other board games like shogi go equally drosh like chess i have no idea no idea i feel like go is less drosh but I, I don't know for sure well let's jump back to the game c4 so we kind of have like almost like a reverse french structure here and i kind of like white's position it makes sense to me but you have to be very careful if you castle too quickly then you can fall under uh big kingside attack. 
which one leads to more tactical game e4 or d4 i mean depends on who you ask but conventional wisdom says that e4 leads to more open positions which means more um more tactical positions but there, it's not always the case you can get very tactical positions from d4 um, but generally i would say e4 leads to more open game oh go has a rule against repeating positions but how would you how would you work on it in chess because sometimes in chess like you objectively have to repeat the position you know like everything else loses unless you repeat right so how would you avoid that because then that's kind of it can be unfair for one of the sides yeah it feels like they would have to figure out exactly how to um how to manage that Yeah, because then it changes the game. You now have to avoid positions where you're <laughs> you're forced to repeat. Okay, some changes in the structure here. So c5 takes takes bishop e5, queen c2, e5, and now white has this very nice c4 square that he can use. Yeah, honestly, I I'm liking white here. I feel like the structure is going to... Um, play out in white's favor though down a minute uh, i'm not sure hall guild um i just think like some opening some variations kind of end in a uh, in a draw but um, but but yeah but then it's, the question is like well then does white lose because they repeated or does black lose because they repeated uh, you know like <laughs> it kind of changes the dynamics of the game like there are some lines where black can force a repetition but if they don't force the repetition they end up a lot worse so then it's kind of unfair for them. Like white can choose a specific line <laughs> that either black repeats and they make a draw or they don't repeat, they end up much worse. Uh, and so then that kind of, yeah, puts the onus on black. Even though when we think about it, it from like a philosophical way, it really should be, it really should be white, right? That avoids the repetition they have the first move the advantage of the first move and they should be the ones that are um you know kind of forced to avoid the repetition oh uh, andrew jackson if you want to get in i don't know why the play command didn't work usually it does but uh there you go there's the link to join the arena um you do need to be a member of the uh chess.com club but there's yeah still 30 minutes to join yeah, honestly, I think the uh, the whole draws thing is kind of overblown. I mean, it's been something that we've talked about in chess for like decades and decades. Like even Capablanca said stuff like, oh, chess is dead. Like I can draw every game if I want to. And so I think it's just been happening for a long time. And then, yeah, no, I think people are, are just very reactionary to it. Like you have one tournament when there's some draws and people are like, oh, chess is dead. Class. Like there's there's always like these two posts. Like there'll be a tournament where there's like four draws and then people are like classical chess is dead. And then the next round, it'll be like all four decisive results. And then people are like classical chess is not dead. So I don't know. I mean, I think World Cup was pretty exciting. There are lots of like very interesting tournaments. So yeah, I think people just... Um, Think people overblow it you know as long as you have an interesting format and you invite interesting players you're gonna have interesting tournaments i think simple as that and uh, yeah i don't i don't think we need more players like tall i think you know carlson is a very technical player and he's a very interesting player to look at you know his style of play couldn't be further from tall so yeah I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think the fans have to do some work as well. Oh, Laurent with the flag. 
like sometimes there will be a tournament and the games are all super interesting and i'll see people post like oh these games aren't interesting classical chess is dead it's like no you're just not like you don't find them interesting but it doesn't mean like the games are games are really interesting <laughs> like so many deep points uh like and yeah okay it's like not the openings that like someone prefers and so for them it's like oh not not an interesting tournament well, okay uh, it sucks to be you i guess i don't know uh <laughs> sorry like i mean the match with carlson and caruana that was 12 draws and like every single game was super interesting super fighting like i don't often f like follow events live right like maybe i'll follow a little bit but like for the world championship match like i was watching like every single move and the games had a lot of interesting points and then people are like, oh, you know, 12 draws, classical chess is dead. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. I thought that was a great match. Um, Mad Bobbage, no, I don't think, um, I don't think I have a preference for either. I, I think I just try to find interesting positions, whether they're the main line or a sideline to me doesn't really matter. And uh, yeah, I think in general, people just kind of overblow everything. Um, Right, they see the engine eval as Polly's pointing out, and they think the position is is drawn. So many times I see someone say like, "Oh, I missed a draw," and like the engine draw that they missed is like twelve moves long, and it was super complicated. And it's like, "Oh, I blew a dead drawn position," but like, no, you didn't. Like, <laughs> just because the engine says zero zero doesn't mean it was dead drawn. Like rook against rook, you know, is a dead drawn, right? But if you have a, a ooh, that doesn't look good. Uh, if you have a position with like a bunch of pieces just because the engine evaluates it one way doesn't mean that the position is dead right so yeah i really sympathize sympathize with people like david when he tells people not to use the engine because uh yeah i feel like the engine it hasn't ruined chess but it's i think it has a little bit ruined the game for spectators because they uh tend to miss misunderstand what the engine is actually saying and uh yeah that's kind of a bummer yeah i'm with you nosy picker when when you see players like repeating the opening and they draw the game like on move 15 and it's like the same exact game that's been played before that's not fun obviously we saw rajabov and other players do it a lot and uh, i think the solution to that is yeah you just invite different players if they do it too often. Uh, I have played this Mislav variation myself, and I faced it, so I've played it from both sides. And uh, I used to do okay with it, but then I, I switched it up because I felt like it uh, wasn't... Um, it's not the most ambitious approach against the King's Indian, though it is a very interesting line, I do agree. Yeah, like the Berlin draw where they like go queen d4, queen e4, like, okay, obviously that's that's not interesting. But the majority of draws are not like that. Majority of draws are like really interesting games that then end in a draw because they're well played by both sides. And those I think are are totally fine. Uh, okay, let's jump to another game. Let's try to find some players we haven't seen too much yet how about this one nose nose against big winky yeah i think engines have really worsened the experience especially because a lot of these engines on like chess bomb and chess 24 lee chess chess.com like when you're following the game they give it to, they give you the evaluation at a pretty low depth so it's like a lot of times they're just straight up wrong <laughs> like they're just like someone sacrifices a piece and it's a winning sacrifice and the engine gives minus two like it's not working and then and then the defensive side they play like the most logical defense and and then they lose because the the sacrifice was just winning and then you know some dummy in the chat will be like oh he blundered <laughs> like it's unfortunate because yeah it's just based off the engine 
Um, or so many times you see people, they're just following the game with the engine and then they try to explain moves based on what the engine says. And they're like, oh, you know, he should have, he should have played more prophylactically. You know, it's like, all right, dude, you're just like watching the game with the engine, and then trying to like rationalize the moves. Like, <laughs> you should try to follow games without the engine. And I think it's actually a much more interesting uh, experience. I've been doing commentary, um, or I, I am doing these these three days over this weekend um, for the U.S. Open with uh, Katarina Nemsova, and uh, we're not checking the engine basically at all like during the games we'll check it at a certain like after the game if we're curious what was the evaluation or after we analyze a position for 10 minutes and we just want to know like okay is it like let's see what the engine thinks but during the game we're analyzing it without the engine and uh i think it's much more interesting for for spectators yeah Well, yeah, for sure, not all spectators are chess players, but that's even more reason not to use the engine because like, it can give you a false impression of the game. So if someone is not a chess player, then they're not really equipped to understand what the engine is telling them, right? The engine can be saying plus 2.5, but as a chess player, you see that the position is uh, super complicated. And, um, like you understand that you know during the game like the engine might say this position in front of us is plus two for white right but like we know that this is a very complicated position that doesn't mean it's easy um so but like an amateur that's following the game just sees the engine eval and they don't really know what to make of it right so yeah i think something else should be done Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Duster. Yeah. No, I, I think the case in point, the engine is an incredibly useful tool. And I'm also, I would say, like pro engine. Like, I think there is a correct way to use the engine to kind of enhance your chess. But I think most people don't even come close. <laughs> they just see the engine eval and they kind of stop there. They don't really like spar with the engine or try to understand uh you know the outputs it's um yeah it's just data that i think gets misinterpreted is there an engine eval that shows probability of a result instead of numbers yeah i mean that's what the new ai engines did like alpha zero and Leela zero they evaluate the position in terms of a probability which i don't fully understand to be honest because it's not like the engine knows what's going to happen and, you know, you could look at all the possible moves and assign a probability. Um, but, uh, well, you know, if you take any certain position, certain moves are more likely than others. So I don't really know how they measure that. Like, I don't quite get it, right? Like, the chances that a strong player is going to play queen d8, you know, in some position, is very low. So how does an engine evaluate that the probability, right, versus... I don't know if you guys understand what I'm trying to say, but like you might have 20 legal moves in a position. They're not e all equally likely that someone is going to play them, right? Some moves are very much less likely. So I don't know how the engine uh, calculates that. Uh, Leela Zero is available to everyone. I believe Leela Zero is uh, free to download. But uh, you, need, uh, you need some kind of interface to work with it, like uh, a chess base or some other, some other program. Yeah, and then the latest Stockfish um, also uses probability. Though I, I always got used to the number evals, so I don't really get how to use the probability evals. There's some setting in chess base. If you right click on your engine, it says like show win percentage or something like that, and you can switch back and forth. Uh, but yeah, long story short, the engine is often wrong, especially on online sites, and it doesn't give an accurate picture of what's going on. And um, and then players kind of get a wrong impression. Yeah, I totally agree with what Google fan is saying in the chat uh, about Gelfin's recommendation. Like, if you want to use the engine, fine, but first 
try to like get your own understanding of the position then look at it with the engine right Ooh, queen takes a8 good find that's gonna be gg all right let's see who else we got party breaker against uh cartier tank huh interesting position actually i want to turn on one sec i want to turn on my fan here Okay, looks like black is a pawn up. Doesn't want the end game. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard to say. Okay, 97, good. That important developing move. Yeah, chess stock. Honestly, I I I don't understand how they how they estimate probability. Uh, I think LC0 is Lila0. I think that's the same thing. It's just short for like Lila Chess 0, but people say uh, Lila0 typically or Lila. Yeah, Lauren, that's that's I think a great a great uh, way to train. Like first, oh boy, critical moment. Wow, very complicated. Ooh, rook f2. I think what black needed to do here was give queen g5 check and then play g6 to defend the mate. And then I think black is winning because we're up the exchange. But now queen takes b2, rook f2, f5. Ooh, queen e6 check. Yeah, that's a blunder. That is a nice desperado tactic. You give check with the both queens are hanging, but you give check with the queen and and take it. Unfortunate, unfortunate. Yeah, I thought the Leela probability is um Oh, so there there are two outputs. One is probability that a position is winning, the other is a probability that various moves will be visited. Interesting. Yeah, I don't I don't really understand it to be honest. Um but I do know Leela, I mean, is an incredible engine. Like it performed really well in the TCEC and uh feel like it's completely changed how they because now like the latest versions of stockfish have kind of like borrowed ideas from from Leela because now stockfish itself uses some kind of neural net to make its evaluations which is very cool and the, the stockfish 14 stockfish 13 they're way stronger than stockfish 12 in previous versions it's like a very very clear difference so that's kind of cool but uh, ultimately again it's one of those things well, like, um, you know, Benji was talking about during the, the talk, a lot of people focus when it comes to nutrition on like what time you should eat and like fasting and like all these kind of like um, trends in terms of like nutrition, but like the fundamentals like still account for like most of the work. Like you still need to eat healthy. <laughs> like as long as you eat healthy, you'll be fine. But if you, you eat unhealthy and then you like time your diet very specifically, like it's not really going to account for that much. I think the same thing applies to chess. Like people are always worried a lot about like, oh, what engine should I use? Or like, you know, how much time should I spend on this or that? But like, yeah, really, you should just be like trying to work on chess a little bit every day. Try to solve some puzzles, try to play some games. Like these are the fundamentals 
and like finding you know people like love to argue about like the woodpecker method and like chessable and like oh is this actually the best form but like you, you just need to do some training most of all and then and then you'll improve uh, that's kind of the the biggest thing That's interesting. I thought Leela Zero or Alpha Zero came from uh, Alpha Go. I thought it was a Go engine. Or did they do Shogi first and then Go and then Chess? Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, I, I really don't understand the whole neural network thing. Oh man, crazy game. Feels like black should be checkmating here. Knight g5, that looks good. And this one? Nice, nice mates. All right, let's keep it going. 10 minutes to go in the arena. Got Armin Amir against Ronan Weiss. What's a training arena versus normal arena? It's mainly just to practice the time control for the sub battles because they're pretty much always going to be three plus two. Um, so versus like a one time arena, that's just like for fun that we sometimes do as well. But this one is specifically, I also try to focus on the games of our subs to see if I can give them any specific pointers. Um, but yeah, usually I just end up following all the random games I can find. Okay, here we have Seth. He is down minor piece. Let's see how that happens. Okay, Sicilian. And uh, I guess he blundered with knight c2. Yeah, could have at least dropped the knight back to a6. And then I don't know if he's okay, but yeah, not losing the piece at least. All right, so don't give up your pieces, guys. Very important. 
this one's gonna hurt. Yeah, guys, I don't know if you know this about chess, but uh, it's actually not good to give up your pieces. I don't know if this is controversial to say, but uh, yeah, giving up pieces is no good. Unless, unless you your other pieces are good. Yeah, so that's kind of, that's where the trickiness comes in. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to give up your pieces because it's like a sacrifice. And uh, the rest of your, the, the key is the rest of your pieces have to be better than the opponent's pieces. That's where a lot of people, they get stuck on this. They just give pieces and then the rest of their pieces are also bad. But no, your rest of your pieces need to be good. Need to be good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would never say never sacrifice. I think sacrificing is good. Most people I think have have a harder time finding good sacrifices or like going for sacrifices versus um the reverse, like doing too many speculative sacrifices. Like it's kind of a spectrum and both both problems exist, right? So some players don't sacrifice enough because they don't want to give up material right, for example, or they just don't see the opportunities, whereas uh, other players end up sacrificing too often because they think it's going to work every time, but it's objectively not sound. And so you have to figure out whether, which side of the spectrum you're on, you know, mainly by analyzing your games. I would say most players that I've seen are on the side where they're not sacrificing enough. Uh, so it's like very rare that they're sacrificing. So it's a problem that I think has to be solved from different directions. Number one, you have to analyze your games and find uh, find the moments where you could sacrifice and it would be successful. I mean, best way to do this is to analyze your games with a stronger player who can often point out these opportunities. Um, but the other thing to do is to study games. You know, like Art of Attack is a classic book. It kind of shows lots of typical sacrifices and you, you, you know, it's not like players are just like geniuses and they come up with ideas. Usually when a GM sacrifices something, it's because they've seen similar sacrifices work and, uh, and they kind of learn from experience, from pattern recognition. Yeah, Vukovic, exactly. Great book. Uh, great book by uh, Vukovic, Art of Attack. I, I think it's one of the, one of the best books ever, still is. It just has a lot of very thematic examples and is very useful. Yeah, Vukovic, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. Yeah, definitely a book that I, I recommend for, for all players. Yeah, not for everyone. Of course, some players have no problem sacrificing and uh, and they have weaknesses in other uh, other parts of the game. So yeah, there's no one size fits all solution for everyone, but yeah, I'm just saying when it comes to sacrificing, what I've seen is most players, let's say, let's say 70, 75%, I think are on the side of they're not sacrificing enough or they're not looking for the opportunities uh, or when they do see the opportunities, they're not going for them often enough. But of course, there's a serious chunk of players that have no problem with sacrificing. They're able to do it. If anything, they might even do it too frequently. But it's all about it's all about balance. Uh, the Timon book uh, I'm not familiar with. Can't really say much about that. Yeah, those two books are still a classic: Art of Attack and um, Modern Chess Strategy. Absolutely. What's the course, uh, a little spaghetti? What was, what's the course that you're referring to? <laughs> yeah, Bullet and Blitz, 
can be good for some stuff, but not good for um, not for good for longer games. Every sacrifice to destroy your opponent. Oh, cool. Yeah, I imagine that covers similar examples to Art of Attack, because there's a lot of chapters in that book, like sacrificing on h7, sacrificing on h6. And so I, I bet that has some similar examples. And yeah, I think that's how you learn. Like you, you learn by examples. You first see a lot of examples of sacrifices that worked out. You try to build up your pattern recognition to these kinds of things. And then during the game, you will notice opportunities to sacrifice yourself. And um, ideally, you should, you should go for it. Now here, I think about bringing the bishop back to d3, but then knight b4 wins the bishop. Although maybe that's still okay for white. Yeah, Gelfin's book's definitely really, really good. Okay, three minutes left in the arena. The games will be finishing automatically. And uh, yeah, just getting aborted, unfortunately. But that's how it goes. So, uh, yeah, guys. Um gauntlet coming up later today i believe at 4 p.m pacific time with uh grandmaster smirnov that should be a fun one david will be streaming that and um we're gonna have the dojo chapters matches uh tomorrow at uh 10 a.m pacific time uh one at 10 a.m one at 11 a.m if you haven't signed up and you want to play for an official team make sure to uh, join via the Google form. You can also visit Discord and uh, go to the roles channel and you can request your role and you can get it automatically and you'll get um, you'll get access to the channel below where there'll be info, how to sign up for the match and that kind of thing. You gotta join the chess.com club and then you'll be able to play in the team match. Um, so that's gonna be happening tomorrow. And I think there's gonna be Dojo Scrubs tomorrow as well. So that'll be uh, that'll be at 3 p.m. Pacific, most likely. Uh, also, I'm doing commentary uh, on the U.S. Open starting today um, at 4 p.m. Pacific as well. So watch the gauntlet, then join the U.S. Open commentary at uh, twitch.tv slash U.S. Chess. I'm going to be covering rounds eight and nine with uh, Katarina Nemsova. Um, and, and, and now we're following the games of like super strong GMs. Like yesterday we were watching Lennerman versus Hans Niemann and like tons of other strong players. So rounds eight and nine will be very exciting. That's going to be, so 4 p.m. Pacific today for round eight. And then tomorrow the round is going to be at 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time for the final round. And then we might end up watching the uh, Armageddon match because they're for the U.S. Open, the winner gets a spot into next year's U.S. Championship. So sometimes they have an Armageddon to decide who actually gets that spot. Okay, Rosenberg up the exchange. Looks like he has a good position, but I feel like his rooks are lined up on the wrong pawn. <laughs> I guess he wants to go bishop f3. That makes sense. But black's going to go knight d5. I think the rooks should have been lined up on the e-file. But anyway, arena over. Congrats to uh, the two winners, Rosenberg and Vampire Chess, tying for first place. Uh, party breaker. Uh, second uh, silver medal, third place. Very cool. Um, US Open, I'll be doing that at 4 p.m. Pacific time starting today, and then 12 p.m. Pacific for uh, tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, good job, everyone. Hopefully you had fun uh, with the arena. Uh, in case you missed the announcement, uh, unfortunately, the sub battle for tomorrow is being postponed. I, I guess something came up for semi Reina, so um that's not going to be happening tomorrow but we'll figure it out as soon as it gets rescheduled we'll uh, make an announcement in the discord uh and there should be another sub battle next weekend right now we're trying to schedule it with uh anna rudolph so that'll be fun 
Uh, all right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this stream. We'll be rating someone here shortly. Uh, Gauntlet coming up today at 4 p.m. Pacific time on this channel with Grandmaster Smirnoff, I believe. Uh, so that should be very cool. Uh, last week's Gauntlet was fantastic with Amon Hamilton. That was really fun. Um, I'll be doing U.S. Open coverage at 4 p.m. Pacific as well. And then tomorrow at 12 p.m. And then we have the Dojo Chapters matches uh, tomorrow with uh, Prave Duis and Cartier Tank on commentary duties. Uh, so if you haven't signed up for your team, make sure to uh, to do so for um, uh, to play in tomorrow's match. Okay, uh, we do raid Rosen a lot, but I think I'm gonna raid Lafong Hua because he is hosting some kind of um, Sicilian Dragon Masterclass that is starting right now, <laughs> 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. So we're going to raid LaFong. Looks like he's doing some kind of lecture or Masterclass. I don't know, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fun. He's a longtime Dragon player, so he probably has some good stuff to say. And uh, hey, Boondock Striker, thanks for subbing. Much appreciated. Yeah. All right, guys, go say hello to LaFong. Enjoy the lecture. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. And then maybe I'll see you guys later for the uh, the US Open coverage on uh, twitch.tv slash US Chess starting 4 p.m. Pacific time. All right, guys, have a good one.